Yes, uh, ready to go? Uh, good afternoon, students. Uh, uh, my name is Juho Choi uh, from Korea Aerospace University. And um, as you know, I am uh, teaching together with the uh, Professor Haftka for this course. And uh, uh, I did not uh, make decision uh, quite yet, but uh, I consider the office hours uh, for me uh, at this time, and uh, that can be changed uh, after discussion with uh, uh, the students or Professor Haftka. And before starting the lecture, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I have uh, uh, graduated, uh, uh, received a PhD of mechanical engineering from uh, KAIST, uh, Korea Aerospace Institute of Science and Technology. It was uh, 1987, a long time ago. And uh, at that time, uh, that uh, institution was not famous, but uh, nowadays uh, it's famous uh, to some degree. <laughs> Can be uh, found in the uh, many articles in the literature. And I have worked as a, a field engineer in the Samsung Corning. Uh, the company have manufactured the, the TV uh, glass uh, for brown tubes. So that kind of a, a uh, business does not exist today because uh, all the uh, TV uh, went into the LCD glass. So uh, it disappeared after I uh, went out from the uh, company. And after that, I uh, went into the, uh, the uh, university, Korea Aerospace University, and I'm now the professor. And my uh, former research area was the, uh, like uh, Professor Haftka, about the optimum design and applications. But uh, currently, I'm uh, 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 mostly working on the reliability engineering, including the system reliability and uh, uh, verification validation, uh, as I will uh, teach uh, in this course, and also the prognostics and health management. That uh, stands for uh, the prognostics and health management. And I have a laboratory at my university. The title is the uh, System Design Optimization. And uh, you can find it uh, at the website of that. And I have the students. And I, I also am uh, running a joint PhD program uh, with the uh, Professor Nam Kim at the uh, Mechanical Engineering of this uh, university. And uh, one of my students uh, are studying. Uh, he, uh, she uh, spent the uh, uh, first two years at my university and the later two years here, and uh, she will uh, uh, hopefully get uh, uh, both uh, PhDs from the two universities. All right, yes. Just an introduction of my university. It's quite close from the uh, international airports, also uh, from the downtown Seoul. So, uh, it attracts so many good uh, students uh, from uh, in the country. And the fact of my uh, university, uh, the time difference is, uh, as you know, uh, very uh, large. We have uh, uh, 13 hours ahead uh, of the uh, Eastern time of United States. So uh, uh, daytime is the night time. And the fact of my university is, uh, my university is uh, dedicated to, to, to uh, aviation and aerospace engineering and a relatively uh, long history in our country. And the uh, size is a little bit small, <coughs> but the, the alumni of our university accounts for, responsible for the uh, more than 15% of the research in our country. And uh, we have a very strong uh, research activity, and uh, it stands uh, the ninth uh, rank in our country uh, last year. Here's the uh, course overview. I uh, think the uh, Professor Haftka already uh, talked about this at the, uh, the first lecture, but I'd like to uh, uh, address this once again. <coughs> uh, as we know, the Professor Haftka initiated this course and planned this course, and I uh, participated in this course. And uh, I, uh, the reason that I participated is because I uh, once taught at my graduate school, the Bayesian method in the reliability problems. So I am responsible for that part, and Haftka takes uh, the another part. 
And as a result, we made a course like this. Uh, the uh, course consists of three modules. Module one uh, uh, is uh, dealing with the uh, uncertainty quantification. And module two is the reliability-based optimization. And the third is the verification and validation. And in the module one, uh, the, uh, within the uncertainty quantification, Haftka teaches the traditional issues uh, in the uncertainty quantification. And uh, he will move to the uh, uh, reliability-based optimization. And in my part, I will take the uh, non-traditional uh, uncertainty quantification. And uh, that can be easily uh, uh, accounted for by uh, using the Bayesian methodology. So I will uh, teach you the, uh, this methodology throughout this uh, course, uh, the lecture. And uh, I will uh, mostly uh, resp be responsible for the verification and validation uh, based on the Bayesian framework. So within the module one, you can see uh, the uh, uh, blue part, red part. Blue part is half car, red part is me. And uh, once half car teaches the traditional issues, uh, I mean, the, uh, for the first two, he taught already the traditional probability distribution. And I will follow him. I will uh, teach the non-traditional part of the probability distribution. And uh, also, he will teach the uh, traditional regression. And then I will follow him and the uh, non-traditional Bayesian regression. In this way, we will take turns or alternatively teach you. So this is the uh, uh, introductory part of my uh, today's lecture. And uh, I will move to the uh, today's lecture. And this is the outline. I will begin with the uh, <coughs> Bayesian theory only uh, from a conceptual point of view, not uh, throughout the full formulation. I'd like to uh, introduce you, uh, you to what is the meaning of the uh, Bayesian theory. And uh, within that theory, uh, we have to learn uh, three important concepts, which are the Bayesian probability, a base rule, and uh, uh, Bayesian inference. And, and then I will uh, introduce a very uh, simple uh, example, which is a coin trials example, in order to illustrate these concepts. Then I will step into the main part of this lecture. Uh, the main part of this lecture begins with the, uh, uh, the third uh, bullets. Uh, we have to learn some uh, elementary uh, theories uh, before uh, having the knowledge of the full Bayesian uh, uh, methods. So I will uh, begin with this uh, uh, teaching this uh, stuff, and uh, we'll end this uh, lecture today. Uh, before going into the lecture, I, I'm not sure whether I can uh, uh, cover all these issues uh, in uh, today's 50 minutes, because this is the, uh, my uh, first attempt in uh, English lecture, and also the second attempt uh, that I teach the Bayesian method. So, uh, uh, there will be some kind of a uh, mistake or trial and error, and I uh, will appreciate your understanding with this. So the first part, the first of the three important concepts is the, the Bayesian probability. Uh, <clears throat> in the statistics community, uh, there have been uh, two kinds of probability. One was the uh, classical or traditional probability, and the other is the Bayesian probability. And uh, in my case, uh, I, uh, uh, I first uh, learned uh, this concept, the Bayesian uh, uh, probability concept, back in uh, tw 20, uh, uh, two, uh, 2007 or 8. And it was a very uh, great experience for me, personally. So. Uh, I was uh, quite interested, and uh, I, uh, my, uh, I studied a lot uh, with this uh, stuff, and uh, uh, made uh, some kind of uh, a number of uh, literatures uh, with this uh, uh, area. In this uh, uh, probability, 
In the classical sense, the probability is defined, as you know, that the uh, relative frequency of an event given many repeated trials. So uh, we, in order to uh, obtain the probability in this way, we need to do some, uh, uh, a number of trials physically and uh, uh, get the results and the value. Uh, on the other hand, in the Bayesian probability, the probability is defined as the a degree of belief uh, that it was true based on an evidence at hand. So uh, the classical probability is also called the objective. On the other hand, the Bayesian is also called the subjective. Here's a, a good example that illustrates the, uh, the two concepts, uh, which is the Saturn mass estimation. You know that that is the Saturn. <clears throat> And this problem was uh, already studied by a uh, famous uh, mathematician, Laplace, back in the uh, 19th century. For this problem, uh, when we uh, use the classical approach, uh, they say that the mass is fixed but unknown. So no matter how many times you do the measurement, although it's never possible, to measure this uh, Saturn. But uh, no matter how many trials uh, you do the me uh, me measurements, you will end up with the, uh, always the same value. So uh, with this way, we, we cannot uh, measure the mass in a, a probabilistic way for this problem. On the other hand, in the Bayesian approach, we can do this. The mass can be measured in a probabilistic way because I said that the, the probability represents our degree of belief. So, uh, in fact, Laplace uh, solved uh, this problem himself at the time based on his observation at uh, that uh, period. And the result is this figure. And uh, the uh, probability distribution you see is the a solution and represents his belief on the uh, mass uh, of the Saturn at that time. The second important concept I'd like to introduce is uh, uh, base rule. Uh, the base rule is represented by uh, this equation. Yes. A degree of belief. Yes. Can you explain that? So the traditionally, uh, so Professor Hatska told me that uh, I have to repeat the question for the people uh, uh, learning remotely. <laughs> so your question is the uh, what is the meaning of the degree of belief? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, in the you see here in this uh, graph and uh, the di distribution shape, uh, traditionally, it should be something like uh, after a, a many number of trials, we get uh, a number of uh, a frequency or numbers uh, at that uh, location uh, that uh, the height represents that uh, uh, frequency. But in Bayesian sense, uh, it is not like that. The uh, height represents our uh, level of uh, belief. So if the height, is, uh, the, the height is great, it means that we have a, a strong degree of belief at that location, at that value. So uh, I hope that uh, can answer to your... So even for basic probability, we need to do trials like we do in a classical probability? Yes, I will explain later about that. And you will see what it means. height corresponds to the degree of belief of that, that that particular value is true. Right. Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, shortly after this, I will uh, 
uh, explain uh, about the explain the concept using a simple example. So, second important uh, uh, concept we have to learn is the base rule, a famous equation, and uh, uh, the base rule uh, states that the probability distribution of some unknown parameter, in this case, theta. Uh, I'm afraid that the, uh, the laser point is not uh, quite uh, working. Uh, so it's not easy to uh, point uh, the thing. Uh, <clears throat> the, in this case, we, let's say we have an uh, unknown parameter theta. And uh, we'd like to know uh, the probability distribution of this theta that the Bayesian uh, rule uh, states that the uh, probability distribution uh, of theta uh, is obtained by combining prior knowledge, uh, which is given in this uh, p theta, and uh, uh, multiplying uh, to this uh, uh, observed data, which is uh, represented by this uh, likelihood function here, and we get the posterior distribution of uh, uh, theta like this. And um, at first, you will not be a uh, 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 familiar with this rule, and uh, you will learn uh, this equation throughout this course. So uh, uh, it may be uh, not easy to understand this at this time. Another explanation uh, can be made by using this figure. Let's say we have a prior distribution of some unknown parameter theta like this uh, at this location. And uh, let's say we have observed data x conditional on this uh, uh, parameter theta. Then by combining these two, we will obtain the posterior distribution of theta uh, at this location. So the blue curve, uh, it was a pr our prior knowledge. And the red curve, it is our current updated knowledge based on the observed data x. In this way, uh, Bayes rule is uh, uh, gives us the uh, posterior distribution based on our observation x. The features of this uh, Bayes rule uh, is as follows. Uh, using the Bayes rule, we can accommodate the uh, integrated framework for the uncertainty. It can combine the aleatory uncertainty as well as the epistemic uncertainty. And I uh, wonder if you have already taught from uh, Professor Haftka about the, what is aleatory and what is epistemic. I, I assume you already know that. So the Bayesian uh, approach can account for both kind of uncertainty in a single framework. The second one is the so-called Bayesian updating. The Bayesian updating means that as more data provided, the previously obtained the posterior is turned into the prior now. And uh, uh, using this uh, prior, uh, more data provided, then we can another a new posterior distribution. And uh, this uh, uh, slide uh, explains this uh, process. And uh, we call this as a Bayesian updating. The third uh, and the most important uh, concept in the Bayesian theory is the Bayesian inference. We know that there are two kinds of uh, processes. One is the deductive, and the, the other is the inductive. Uh, in the deductive process, we have uh, some kind of a cause or a hypothesis, as you see here in the left uh, figure. Then we obtain the outcome from the hypothesis, like a BCD. Uh, in the inductive process, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, the outcome first. We have the observation. And we'd like to infer, reversely or inversely, the hypothesis or cause. This is called the inductive process. And uh, in uh, uh, engineering applications, we see many occasions that we require that inductive process. Uh, we have many occasions that we need to infer the cause, and we only have the observations. In that case, the Bayesian approach can be very useful to handle this uh, problem. And it is uh, 
easily solved by using this equation. And you remember just a moment ago, uh, you saw this uh, equation. And this equation can be turned into the same uh, statement but with the, another terminology. So you can compare, although uh, uh, you, if you have any uh, uh, PowerPoint at your laptop, you can compare by yourself this. This is the original equation. And uh, you uh, replace theta by some uh, another word, hypothesis. So uh, the same thing. Uh, this is another uh, expression of the base rule, but in more extract, abstract form. So with this equation, we can infer the hypothesis, uh, and we have only the data and the prior knowledge on that hypothesis. We can conclude and update our hypothesis based on this equation. Here's another simple example explaining deductive and inductive. We'd like to consider a simple uh, case, a normal distribution. We know that uh, in the normal distribution, we need to have uh, two parameters to characterize that distribution. One is the mean, and the other is the standard deviation. And in the, in the inductive process, uh, let's say we uh, know the uh, two parameters values, uh, mu equals 10, sigma equals 2. Then we obtain the outcome. We obtain the observed data that follows this distribution. This is the deductive process. In the inductive process, that process is reversed. We only have the observed data x. And uh, based on this, we'd like to infer inversely uh, the uh, uh, parameters of the normal distribution, and uh, we will uh, uh, get the result like this figure. And the figure represents the PDF, and the PDF represents our degree of belief, as I said before. And uh, uh, at this, the location with the, uh, the uh, higher uh, PDF value, you can see there, uh, we have a strong belief that uh, sigma and mu be somewhere between, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, the PDF represents that kind of information. In addition, if we have uh, any uh, prior knowledge on the mu and sigma, we can incorporate also that using the prior distribution. And uh, we will uh, obtain more updated knowledge on the uh, two parameters. So uh, I will move uh, to the next slide. Here's some a brief historical notes. Uh, it was uh, Thomas Bayes who was not mathematician, not physicist. Uh, he was a priest, and uh, Thomas Bayes uh, first proposed the uh, Bayes theory at this time, and Laplace discovered. Uh, this theory and put uh, his name, uh, I mean the Bayes uh, theory, uh, uh, the title as Bayes theory, uh, Laplace made it, and uh, generalized to many problems. <clears throat> uh, after that, for more than 100 years, however, uh, the Bayesian, this kind of a degree of belief, was rejected uh, due to its vagueness and uh, subjectivity. Instead, the objective uh, pre frequency was accepted in the uh, statistics. And later on, uh, only in the 20th century, uh, Jeffries, who is another uh, famous uh, statistician, rediscovered this and made a modern theory. But until the 80s, it uh, still remained only as a theory because of uh, its uh, requirement for expensive and costly computation. So uh, from the year 1990, the Bayesian uh, statistics and theory became popular and uh, practical use. And um, uh, this uh, uh, approach is uh, 
uh, applied to uh, many areas, not only in the uh, science and engineering, but also in the uh, another uh, areas like uh, economics and medic medicine uh, area. And uh, you can see here the interesting notes at the uh, bottom of uh, this slide. Uh, what is Bayesian statistics and how, uh, why everything else is wrong? Uh, although this uh, uh, title seems a little bit aggressive, uh, this was uh, given by this professor. And uh, I think that uh, uh, this uh, represents uh, how the Bayesian is accepted in the modern community. So I'd like to explain the uh, Bayesian concept using this uh, coin trials example. Uh, for uh, a strange, we have a strange looking coin like this. And uh, for this uh, coin, we'd like to uh, estimate the probability of a front side uh, based on some uh, a number of uh, uh, trials or experiments. And uh, so the, this is, uh, you see here, the, this is the parameter theta to be estimated. And uh, I'd like to assume that the true value is 0.78. And this uh, can be obtained after an infinite number of uh, trials, and we cannot do that. And the uh, only thing that we can do is uh, uh, a few number of uh, trials. For this problem, well, we'd like to uh, estimate the uh, parameter theta uh, based on the uh, Bayesian process. And uh, the process is given in this uh, uh, lower figure. And for this, we need uh, two kinds of uh, uh, information. Uh, one is the prior, the other is the data. And uh, for the prior, we consider three cases. First one is the we don't have any uh, prior information on the parameter theta. So uh, number one is no prior information. And the case number two is the, uh, we uh, guess that will be something like uh, uh, 0.5 plus minus something. So uh, we assume that uh, it will be uh, normally distributed centered at 0.5 with this uh, sigma. But we know that this is a kind of a, a little bit wrong assumption because we know already that the, the true value is 0.78. So uh, this should not be the prior, it uh, leads to some uh, uh, erratic uh, results. But uh, let's say we uh, can assume uh, as the prior like this. And uh, case number three, another wrong assumption. Uh, somebody can uh, think that uh, it will be because the coin is uh, not normal, so coin will be uh, something like a biased so we uh, assume that the, it will be somewhere between 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. So with these three uh, cases of prior, we will uh, go through the Bayesian uh, process. And uh, in terms of the experimental data, we consider two cases. Uh, the smaller number of trials uh, assume that we have a four front side out of uh, five trials. The second is the larger number of trials uh, let's assume that we have uh, tried a uh, hundred times and we got uh, 78 front sides. Uh, we consider these two cases in this problem. And I show you only the results. Uh, how to obtain these results you will learn throughout this course. At this time, I just uh, show you the results. Uh, the results of the case one. The case one is the, uh, we have uh, no prior information. In this case, at first, we start with this. This uh, graph represents, as I said before, our degree of belief on the theta. And the theta is the probability to get the uh, front side. So at first, if we have no prior, it will be something like a uh, uniform distribution. Uh, distributing from 0 to 1, we have no uh, uh, precedence of uh, the uh, probability. After a small number of trials, we get these results. This represents our degree of belief uh, based on this small number of trials. And uh, we have a, a more likely uh, conclusion that uh, somewhere, between, somewhere in the uh, 
point eight, but not uh, strong. After more number of trials, 78 out of 100 uh, trials, then we obtain this result. And this result um, uh, represents our uh, degree of belief uh, on theta. And uh, theta will be something like uh, a point 0.8 uh, around there. So this is the result of the case 1. And the next move to the case 2, we start with the uh, prior uh, with the normal distribution like this. And after a small number of triers, we uh, get the uh, move to the right like this. And the more number of triers, uh, we get more move to the uh, right like this. But uh, because we uh, started with the uh, wrong prior, we still uh, not arrive at the uh, uh, true value, which is 0.78. And uh, in this case, we have uh, much more number of trial, have much more number of triers uh, to get this value. So if we employ wrong prior, we need uh, to uh, much more uh, experiments or observations in order to get the true answer. Next is the third uh, case. In this case, uh, we start with the uh, prior like this. As I said, uh, it will be, uh, at first we assume that the, uh, the uh, theta will be placed somewhere between uh, 0.7 and 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.5 and 7. So the figure will look like this. Like this. And uh, uh, after a small number of triers, we get this. And the uh, larger of number of triers, we get this. In this case, we cannot exceed the uh, upper barrier due to we employ the uh, wrong prior. So in this sense, uh, you can see the uh, prior information very important. So for example, in the first case, you have no knowledge. So you assume it is uniformly distributed. And in the second case, you, you have a Gaussian distribution. So, uh, so these two kind of information, how do you define? Uh, how do you determine which is uh, more correct than the other? Yeah. So you asked, yes. Repeat, Repeat the question. Yes, yes. Uh, you asked that uh, uh, in the case one, we have uh, no prior. And in case two, we have a uh, uh, normal distribution as a prior. And uh, how do you, uh, how do we uh, make that assumptions or information? Is that the question? Uh, determine which assumption is more correct? Uh, among the, uh, the, those three priors, how uh, do we uh, estimate that which one is uh, better and which one is not? Yeah. Uh -huh. We don't know. I think what I to ask the question better is how do you determine that the most accurate result will be 0 0.78? The 0.78 question, the 0.78, how do you determine that value, that is the true value? I guess it's uh, the quite similar question as uh, the other uh, student. So uh, I told you that the, the, we, we don't know the uh, true, because in this problem, uh, I just, uh, I just uh, show you that uh, the problem, we, don't, we have the exact answer, but in reality, in practice, we don't know the answer. We don't know the exact uh, uh, solution. So we just have to uh, uh, guess or assume some prior. And we don't have any uh, strong belief on that prior. We, we should not uh, make that a prior. In that case, uh, it's better to uh, start with the uh, no prior information. So uh, the, regarding the prior, we have to be very uh, careful to make uh, into the process. So in actual, like in real world, like when we apply this vision theory, like uh, the, this uh, estimate technique, like do we have to actually make several cases and try them out and see the pattern, or like how do they usually deal with this uh, dilemma? 
uh, as long as we can validate or verify uh, about the uncertain or unknown something. Otherwise, there is no other way that this prior was correct or not. So the only check is if we take more number of trials will converge to the uh, exact result? Yes, that will uh, give us uh, the most correct answer. Independent of what prior we take? Independent of what prior. But um, we have to uh, uh, track or monitor the trend of the uh, distribution. If the distribution goes to some kind of a specific distribution, then we can have a, a strong belief on that. So in the first case, uh, we don't have any prior knowledge, but we still get the best result of the three uh, cases that, that are shown. Because so, uh, we did not employ wrong prior. But my question is that what is the advantage of having a prior? Is it like it will make things converge faster if we have some good knowledge? or? If we have some good knowledge, I'm sorry, I have to uh, interpret this uh, question to the remote people, but um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, your question was, um, what is the advantage of uh, employing prior in this problem? Because you can always get a good uh, convergence. Uh, in this case, when we employ the wrong prior for the second or third cases, we ended up with the uh, less uh, good results. Uh, that explains the importance of prior. If we em employ the wrong prior, we will end up with the uh, uh, worse uh, results than the uh, no prior case. And uh, there was another question here. Yeah, I'm thinking, as, as this process looks like a refined process, like you give it a assumption, like a prior, and uh, you add more data, add more data, and then you refine to something. and. Uh, the more data you have, uh, they will regardless of the prior you have. But it seems like it didn't have much advantage over the traditional way. They all need a large amount of data. So what is one of advantage? So your question is, what is the advantage of a whole this process yes. compared to the uh, traditional? Yeah, because you have, you, you have to do a lot of Tens or whatever, you have to get a lot of data to get this super like a refinement. You have to get a lot of data. So, what is the advantage over the old one? I'm not that expert to <laughs> answer that question. But at least I can say that uh, uh, you will see. You will see the, the answer throughout this course in this semester. And uh, in practice, we will have only a handful of data. And uh, nevertheless, we have to make any conclusion with that information. In this case, I show you uh, 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 five trials, 100 trials, 1,000 trials, but uh, it's not the case in practice. In practice, we will only have uh, a few number of data and uh, make decision in company. And it works based on that uh, limited information and uh, any prior knowledge, if it's uh, correct, uh, combining the, those two, we have uh, some kind of a, uh, results and make decision. That is used. Um, is this OK? <laughs> yeah. So can we use classical probability to to some degree, uh, can we use the classical approach for this kind of problem? To some degree, yes. But um, uh, for the most of the cases, uh, we need another uh, approach, like uh, this uh, Bayesian uh, theory. And uh, uh, the, uh, mo the most significant difference between the classical and uh, this is uh, about the prior. Uh, when there is a prior, when we employ the prior, uh, that makes us the Bayesian approach. Otherwise, it uh, can be also taken care of by the classical approach. And uh, uh, so you're basically saying that uh, in the event that we have very little data, the establishment of a decent uh, prior would give us better results. Is that what you're saying, sir? No, no, no. 
if we, the thing is that if we have a very good knowledge, uh, whatever it came from, if we have a good knowledge, like uh, there is an expert, and he has a very strong belief on the, uh, the theta uh, places uh, between uh, here and here, and if it's very good, we employ that. Yeah, and we only uh, incorporate only a few number of data and uh, get the results. So it's highly subjective. Yes, highly subjective. Yes. And uh, there were another uh, questions there. No. Yes. So this was the main part of the Bayesian process. And I uh, explained that uh, we uh, infer, we estimate the unknown theta like this. So each uh, graph of a PDF or a distribution represents our degree of belief on the theta based on what? Based on the prior and the data. And uh, once we have uh, this information, we can, pre we can use this information for future prediction. For this, I'd like to introduce another uh, question. What, let's say we have uh, obtained a posterior PDF of theta. We, I, I made uh, a several number of uh, uh, results uh, from the previous slide, but uh, let's say uh, among them, we have uh, this uh, result, this uh, posterior distribution. Uh, this is coming from uh, uh, the data, 7, 8 out of 100 trials. And uh, the problem is, uh, what is the predicted probability to get all five fronts when try five times? For this problem, let's say we know the exact value. When we know the exact value, which is 0.78, I said, the probability to get front side, then the results will be like that. You can, this is a kind, kind of a common sense uh, problem because we know that the probability to get the front side, if we try five times, the probability to get the all five fronts is that, 0.78 multiplied five times. But in reality, we don't know that value. In reality, we only have uh, this trial. Then we have uh, this information, not this, not a single value, but a distribution. And the uh, distribution represents our belief. Using this, we can further process like this. In this case, we draw random samples that satisfies that distribution. For example, we can make uh, 10,000 samples of theta from this. And based on these 10,000 samples, we can compute probability P for each individual value of the samples. Then we get the another 10,000 samples of uh, probabilities, and which is given by this uh, blue histogram. And uh, from this histogram, we can uh, further process to get the uh, median values or confidence bounds, and uh, compare these results with the, uh, the upper parts. Compare these results to these results. In this case, we know the exact value. We no, we get the exact uh, probability. But in practice, I said we only have uh, this uh, information. In this case, uh, we end up with this distribution instead of uh, this single value. So that uh, represents uh, the uh, Bayesian uh, results. And I'd like to say the, this part uh, boxed here I, uh, is called the posterior product prediction process as compared to the uh, estimation process. How do you determine that the samples are sufficient for the posterior process? 
Uh, that's a matter of another, uh, yes. <laughs> I will also address that issue later. Uh, it's a matter of a sampling technique, yes. So it's something like, um, I wonder if you guys know about the finite element analysis. And uh, in the finite element analysis, we have a pre-processing, main process, and post-processing. That's something like that. So the left part, estimation process, is something like a main process. And the right part is something like a post-processing. So I have to now uh, move into the main uh, lecture uh, and uh, some elementary theory in order to understand the Bayesian uh, in more uh, uh, specific way. And uh, I'm afraid I have to uh, end this lecture today because it's already uh, uh, 12.33. So uh, at two minutes. So uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, 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 tell you another thing about the uh, 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 next lecture. I hope you could uh, bring uh, your laptops, as I told you uh, last Friday, uh, to practice yourself here uh, using the MATLAB. So I uh, hope you guys all uh, understand the MATLAB to some degree. And I have uh, MATLAB codes also in the lecture notes, so you can uh, uh, copy and paste and uh, look at the results uh, together with me. And I will uh, do the teach uh, in that way in order to make you, you understand uh, quite easily. And another thing is I need to, uh, I'm not sure whether you can uh, get the uh, uh, stuff uh, yourself or not, but um, uh, it's uh, much better to bring, uh, if possible, the uh, textbook made by, <coughs> at this time, ne next time is uh, uh, this uh, textbook. It's written by uh, Professor Mahadevan as a very famous book, and I will uh, address the chapter two uh, next lecture, and uh, after that, I will move to the uh, uh, Gelman's textbook, it is uh, uh, given in the syllabus uh, of the Professor Hafska, uh, Gelman. So for the most of the parts, when I teach the uncertainty quantification of a module one, I will uh, uh, most, in the most part use this uh, textbook uh, to teach. And, um, I wonder if you uh, can uh, bring or copy or whatever away uh, this uh, textbook. It will be uh, much better for you to understand that. So, OK. So this is in the end of my uh, today's lecture. Thank you for the attending and the listening. <laughs>